Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Howard University School of Law Social Justice CLE Seminar. This morning, we're going to talk about esports. Esports is an industry we cannot ignore. I'm Mason Ash, your moderator this morning, I'm CEO of Ash Sports and Entertainment Consulting. I've uh, been practicing for about 30 years and also am on the adjunct faculty at Howard Wharton Business School. Uh, and Georgetown as well. My panelists today are Eva Pulliam from Errant Fox, Arthur McAfee, uh, Senior Vice President of uh, Football Operations, Policy Education, and Relationship Management at the NFL, uh, Aaron Leach, Managing Associate at Oric, and we have a special guest, Gordon Bellamy, who is a professor of the practice of cinematic arts at the University of Southern California. So before we get into the uh, summary of the industry, I'd like each panelist to just say a little bit about your background and your career and welcome to the audience, please. Uh, Eva first, please. Well, hello, I'm happy to be here, Eva Pulliam. I'm a partner at Errant Fox. My practice focuses in the areas of privacy, advertising, and soft IP, so trademark, copyright, and things like that. Um, I work a lot in the gaming, sports, fashion, and retail industries and the tech industries. And I'll pass it on to, I guess, Arthur. I'm going up the box. Oh, yes, <laughs> hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Arthur McAfee. I'm, I currently work at the National Football League. I happen to be a, a proud graduate of the Howard University Law School. So to, uh, I like to say hello to everyone um, from, from that perspective. Uh, I have spent uh, several years working in the sports industry uh, at the NCAA, uh, the uh, at IMG, which is uh, converted over to the CAA from the agency side. Uh, had the opportunity to work, work um, as counsel at the uh, NFL Players Association for several years. I worked with the USA track and uh, men's and women's track and field team, as well as the uh, United States um, women's soccer team uh, as counsel for uh, for their players association um, and uh, currently work at the uh, National Football League in our football operations unit. Thank you muted Eric. You're on mute. That is the phrase of the year. You're on yeah. mute. <laughs> um, so again, my name is Erin Leach. I'm a managing associate at ORC, as Mason mentioned. Um, I My practice focuses on uh, hard IP, so mainly patents. I started out in 2008 as a patent examiner um, in the patent office, and from then on uh, went to law school and then joined two firms. Uh, I am a proud graduate of Spelman College, and so I hope that eventually Spelman will be brought into the fray of this program. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, I'm really happy to be here with you all today. And um, obviously, my practice um, um, focuses on, which we see a lot today, is the um, the software software space and so um, even video game I currently have a video game um, uh, a case uh, before the federal circuit so this is um, a really interesting panel for me and so I'm excited thank you Aaron so let's get started so this is exciting for me because I've been like I said practicing sports law for 30 years and I have typically been representing the players on the court I've had NBA players NFL players WNBA players rugby players um, and a lot of entertainment stuff around on the music side. But this esports thing is sort of a combination of all of that. And having had a chance to represent some gamers, uh, I've even been corrected since our last tech summit. Uh, last year I was saying I represented esports gamers and they tell me now they are content creators. I said, excuse me, okay, <laughs> content creators and social media influencers. So we've got all these new phrases that for the OGs like me have to kind of really understand what is going on here. Well, since our last uh, summit uh, at, at, at the Howard University School of Law, uh, the industry has continued to really blossom. Global sports revenue 
will grow, as uh, it has been stated, through the end of 2020 to $1.1 billion once all of the counts are in. That's a growth of over almost 16% up from the $950 million of 2019. In 2020, $822 million in revenue, uh, or three quarters of the total market, will come from media rights and sponsorship. Globally, total, uh, total esports audiences will grow from 495 million people in, two, in 2020, uh, a year on year growth of almost 12%. The, so the industry is continuing to really blow up. Mobile esports enjoyed a huge spike in the past year with emerging markets like Southeast Asia, India, uh, and Brazil at the forefront of its growth. But one of the most interesting things, I guess, for our purposes in this discussion today is how are the uh, communities of color participating in the esports industry? And I am proud to say that there are lots of activity going on uh, from uh, the folks of color that are getting involved, but not just playing the game, but also in the other stakeholder positions that are in the industry. Uh, I'd love to, to share that some of the HBCU campuses, for instance, there's a Chris Davis that teaches at esports uh, and gaming classes at Livingstone College, uh, in, uh, HBCU in Salisbury, North Carolina, who says that with HBCUs trying to find uh, those new ways to keep promoting and keep the HBCU uh, attendance alive and growing into the years, he believes that esports is a real draw. And, and we've seen that in the application pool. Uh, recently, Johnson C. Smith University, another HBCU in Charlotte, uh, announced a partnership with Riot Games and launched a minor degree program in esports and gaming. Mark Williams, who is creating a, a new esports program at Florida Memorial University, he says that uh, this opportunity to capitalize on this industry is something that we cannot wait on, and he is actively putting all sorts of programming together to engage the students with also playing as well as the uh, other stakeholder positions we spoke about. There's a Black Collegiate Gaming Association founded in May of 2020, uh, which is a resource for uh, both the HPU campuses as well as uh, students of color, even at other campuses. Uh, Keisha Walker is the president and describes the organization as having a 360 degree approach to helping first their or the universities and secondly, black college students, regardless of where they are enrolled in college, to become not only competitors in esports and, and gaming, but contributors to the overall industry. And she says, in quotes, we will do that by educating them first and foremost, and by secondly, giving them internships and job opportunities with the top technology esports gaming companies in the world. And so where I'd like to transition this into here, I guess at this stage, is I would like to, before we get to some of the examples that Arthur is going to bring up on how the NFL is engaging this, this industry and what they're doing to help the diversity aspect of it. I'd like to first bring in uh, Eva and Aaron to talk about what we hear about the hard and the soft protections involved with the technology that's involved with esports. So <laughs> I will pass the mic on to them, please. So thanks. Thanks, Mason. I'm going to um, start. So we're moving into the intellectual intellectual property part of the panel, which is my passion. And hopefully if there's any technology geeks out there, this will be something, you'll find something interesting in what we're about to say, but even I will be splitting this section. Um, so when I think about intellectual property in the gaming space, I generally think about five different categories of intellectual property. Um, and of course there can be some overlap among those categories. Uh, and maybe there's even six if you consider privacy as one of them. But in terms of the five buckets that I generally think about, um, the first is arguably um, the most relevant to the gaming space. Um, we talked about it in panels yesterday, and Eva's going to talk about it a little bit more, and that is copyright. Um, so similar to books and movies, video game designs, video game storylines, um, the video game computer code, all those works would fall potentially into the copyright bucket. Um, the second is trademarks. And I think this is probably the biggest bucket in terms of the um, amount of property that can actually be protected. 
um, uh, with, with trademark. Um, and so one example is a company name like Nintendo, um, a product name like Xbox, game names like Fortnite, we have gamer IDs, team names, team logos, really anything um, that would make an entity uh, recognizable. And so that's a big category of potential protection if you're interested in creating intellectual property in the gaming space. Uh, the third, which is I think less talked about, um, maybe even less known about, uh, and that is trade secrets. So uh, company secrets like subscriber lists, development tools, and um, even legally collected player data to some extent, um, um, to the extent that those things can be kept a secret, could potentially be um, kept a trade secret. So the fourth is right of publicity. And there was a panel on that yesterday, and Eva's gonna talk about it um, some more in a few moments, but uh, the right of publicity um, generally relates to a person's right to control their name, image, and likeness. So for example, an athlete's ability to control um, a video game avatar of himself or herself. Um, and then the fifth, which is the one I'm gonna focus on uh, today is, is patents. Um, so uh, I think it's pretty obvious that video games require hardware and software development and patents are one way in which inventors can protect their content or the equipment that they create. Um, so I know I'm in an educational environment and I'm talking to technology students and maybe some of you are coders and you probably know that there are ways to make money um, as a game developer and do pretty well. And so one obvious option, I think, is to go work for a company that develops games. Um, one example is Activision Blizzard Entertainment, which is located here in Irvine, where I sit. Um, but there are uh, other companies all around the United States, uh, Electronic Sports, Northern California, um, at the Epic Games, I think is on the East Coast out in uh, headquartered in New York. But again, you have options. Um, but one avenue that I don't think is, um, is as widely known about, especially at least in, 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 in underrepresented communities, is um, the independent developer. And so nowadays with the ability to sell game apps and um, on various mobile platforms or to sell game tools, uh, development tools online, um, independent programmers can make money developing video games and without any association with um, major brand names. Uh, so um, one thing to consider, of course, uh, for such developers, that once you put, um, once you develop your game and you put it out into the atmosphere for a sale, you do run the risk that someone out there will, you know, misappropriate your game. <laughs> so they may change certain things like the design and to get around copyright, um, but they may uh, attempt to resell a repackaged version of your game, but it's really just your core game and they'll do it without your permission. And so in that sense, patents are one way to deter or at least be compensated for that behavior. So I'm going to go into at least one practical tip. Um, if you're if you're considering getting a patent um, on your software. So with respect to patenting software, the goal, which some people don't understand, is not to protect the actual code, as in the words of the code itself. Um, those details really fall into the copyright bucket. Uh, but for patents, the goal is to protect the unique things um, that the code does. So to illustrate, I'm going to give a couple examples. The first is what your claim should not say. And to the extent that you might not know what a patent claim is, just in short, it is um, a sentence, and sometimes a sentence with multiple subparts um, that uh, defines the scope of your invention. So a uh, claim should not read like, the invention is U equals username. U prime equals username underscore database. If U equals U prime, then initiate. But if not U equals U prime, then error. Okay, so that is more, that example resembles code. Um, but the claim should really read more like process steps. 
So here's the, uh, the better example, and this is a simplified version, so this would not be an actual claim, but it, it's along these lines. Um, allow the user to enter a username. Compare the entered username with the username saved in the database. If the two usernames match, then initiate the game. So um, the way that reads is more like an explanation of process steps, um, and it's not uh, it's not specific to any particular programming language. In fact, it's applicable um, to all programming languages. Um, so uh, claim drafting is certainly a skill, and if that's something you're interested in, um, and there are a couple career avenues for you that you might want to consider. One is what we call a patent prosecutor, um, who is sometimes a patent lawyer and sometimes a patent agent, who is someone who has a science background and has taken a test um, at the PTO, but hasn't passed a bar exam, so they're not a practicing lawyer. Um, and another is one something that I, I did for several years, and that is to uh, be a patent examiner at the patent office. Um, and I, I consider that to be um, a, a core part of my, uh, where I learned my, my base knowledge of patents. And while you don't necessarily draft claims at the patent office, you do um, become very familiar with claim structure. Um, so a third is probably even academia, uh, where you can teach the art of claim drafting. Um, but anyway, back to patenting video game software. I think it's very important to understand the pros and cons of doing so. So I've already sort of discussed the pros, um, which are protecting um, your software and preventing others from uh, misappropriating it, but there are some cons. Um, and in fact, video um, game patenting is not actually that common. So uh, the question then becomes why not? One reason I think uh, is that the process of obtaining a patent from start to finish can take quite a long time, upwards of several years, and it's also pretty expensive. So as fast as the gaming industry changes, you know, one minute it's Madden, that's the hot thing, and the next minute is Wii Sports, and then it's Fortnite. And so as it, with the um, patent process, changing so fast, it begins to seem somewhat less worthwhile to some to pursue the long and, and expensive process of obtaining a patent on something that may be irrelevant um, the next day. So, um, but I don't think that's the only reason. I think that another reason is Alice. Um, so patent practitioners and patent law students undoubtedly know what Alice is. Um, and actually, I think it might have come up in a panel yesterday too. But for the uninitiated, Alice v. CLS Bank is a 2014 Supreme Court case that made it more difficult to obtain and enforce software patents. Um, but today I'm not going to go into the details of Alice because the discussion would take like seven hours and I have seven minutes. Um, so I'll just say that Alice set forth a test for determining whether patent claims were too abstract for patenting. Um, and it resulted in, in the invalidation of many software patents that had already been issued. So being familiar, or at least hiring an attorney that's familiar with Alice case law, um, which is also referred to sometimes as section 101 case law, should be a prerequisite to seeking a patent on software. Um, and so just to close out, even though patent applications on video game software haven't historically been popular, they are becoming more common as the gaming movement or the gaming culture becomes more popular and quite frankly, more lucrative. Um, and so lastly, regarding patenting hardware, which I quickly mentioned in the beginning, but things like gaming consoles or controllers or headsets, um, doing so is not nearly as complicated as uh, trying to patent the software. So if you want, if you're interested in patenting hardware, what you'd be looking at as uh, is utility patents or design patents. And design patents are essentially um, what the device looks like. So the shape, the um, in some cases, the color. And so like uh, you would, the, the claim would focus on just the appearance of the, um, of the item. And the utility patents we discussed a little bit before, but you just be um, outlining um, what the invention is, what the apparatus is. So with that, I am out of time and I'm gonna pass it to Eva. So Eva, before you get started there real quick, let me uh, welcome in our 
new family member here, uh, Gordon Bellamy. Uh, Gordon, please give us a background on uh, so just the where you are now and a little brief history of where uh, your your involvement with this esports thing is not just as a gamer back in the day, but as a, as a designer is as well. And you're muted. Good morning. Hey, good morning, everyone. It was it was great. Sorry, Aaron. Just hearing your brilliance. Um, my father uh, was a patent attorney, so it just felt like home. <laughs> hearing you speak about the intelligent, important choices that you make and what you decide what to own. I was just raised with you know with patent <laughs> lectures in my household, so it's just a uh, you know sometimes you know you're in the right place. So anyway, back to me. Uh, my origin. Uh, I was lead designer of Madden Football. Um, and, uh, my, uh, claim to fame in my era, uh, was inventing a creative player and season play and introducing black players to Madden. But you were in college. Let them know you were an intern oh. when you did that. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Well, I was not a flex. So I'm just telling the facts here. Sorry. There's a lot of attorneys in the room. I don't know, you know, trying to <laughs> overstep, but yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, Harvard undergrad went out to electronic arts to live my dream, uh, which was uh, uh, developing software and, you know, on the road to understanding the importance of owning software and just between creating content and owning software, which are very different things, as, uh, as, um, as Aaron just shared with you. Um, I've had the privilege of running both trade organizations for the game industry. Um, I've worked globally for Tencent, which is, if you don't know, that's the first thing you should learn about our game industry is about Tencent. Um, uh, as well as Electronic Arts and THQ, MTV. I now teach at USC. So I, I teach video games. I lead our esports and diversity efforts, and most importantly, our career development efforts about young people like yourselves owning things in this craft and, and moving from a model of heavy consumption, which is well documented, into heavy ownership, which is a different part of the value chain uh, in this new era. And I, that's why I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for including me, because in this new world that's emerging, there's a new pattern emerging again of how much we consume, right? How much we play, how much, how talented we are, and not as powerful a dialogue about how much we own, how much we distribute, right? And y'all are the front lines. Y'all are the foundation, the ones we're going to look to, to, to build that systemic value um, in this new area. Good morning. Thank you, Gordon. That's that's brilliant. Uh, so, uh, Eva, the mic is back to you on the soft, uh, basically IP issues that we need to deal with with respect to uh, esports. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, I, what I'm speaking on is really also about owning you, owning your own brand, owning all of the images on the screen and everything else that's not the hard IP parts of uh, of video gaming. So. You know, you're in law school. For those of you who are in law school, you're thinking about areas of law. Patent is definitely an excellent area. I unfortunately I was an English major, so I did not take that um, take that route. Um, but in soft IP, there's a lot of things going on, and there's a lot of things that really get bound up into consent. And so, as an attorney, you would be assisting clients with making sure that what they agree to is something that really benefits them and, and is representing their their needs and their concerns and the concerns of their in the future their heirs because we're going to talk about things like publicity rights and that's something that you can actually leave in your estate as part of your ip package and that's not something that's always even thought about so your publicity rights are really everything that's about you it's your image it's your catchphrases it's your face it's um even things that might represent you you know uh, Michael Jordan was able to to sue over the use of a 23 in his jersey using publicity rights, and he won a lot of money for uh, in a in a case involving a um, a grocery store that used his publicity rights to promote their grocery store. Um, publicity rights pop up all of the time, and it's just a matter of you actually being able to profit off of your own image and the persona that you've created for yourself. And then once you've done that, you can also pass it on to others. For instance, we represent Einstein. And so how many times have you seen Einstein out there? You, you might see him on a shirt. You might see him in different places. And the estate would benefit from that as long as you've properly protected 
your rights, not only just from a publicity rights standpoint, but also from a trademark standpoint. So that leads us into an additional area of law, which is trademark. So a trademark is, you know, a name, it can be an image. There are even uh, trademarks for colors. Uh, people have tried to trademark tastes and smells. People are attempting to trademark anything. And really what a trademark is, is an indication of source. So if you feel that your brand, your name, you're putting it on a shirt, you know that every time you see someone wearing a slash mark on their shoulder that that represents you, you file a trademark for, for these things and you're getting additional rights. And anytime someone wants to use it, they would have to get your permission. Um, I think Aaron mentioned a lot of the rights. So we have, we touched upon privacy a little bit. This is consent based meaning and I'll, I'll go into privacy, which is consent based a lot in the United States, though there's more laws coming out every day, meaning when you're a player now, you are giving them access to maybe information through technology. So if you sign on and say, I agree, then they can track how fast your heart rate is while you're while you're playing. They can see how much your um, clothes fit you and does that work well for you? How fast are you? These are all things that you're giving over if you sign on the dotted line and agree to these things, right? So these are all different areas that you as a player can own or as a creator, you can develop um, products and services that serve these areas and also in, and create contracts that um, allow this to happen. But the really big area where um, all of this is where you get the, where you get the money from all of this ends up being in what we call licensing. So which comes down to, again, contract law. So as students, your patents, your trademarks, your copyrights, your image, all of that can be essentially, it's not fully sold, it's what we call license, meaning we've given someone permission to use this for a stated purpose, for a stated period of time under certain controls and um, other limitations. And they can use your material, your rights, your hard IP, your soft IP, subject to an agreement and also in exchange for whatever consideration because you know contract class uh we have an offer acceptance and exchange of consideration meaning get paid for all of this hard ip all of this soft ip and include that as part of what you own because you'd be surprised how valuable soft ip is real property is valuable yes but think about how much money it would it would cost to buy the apple design for instance for instance, it would be it would be a significant amount of money. You can place a lot of value in the goodwill and the um, in the brand that you create when you are um, creating soft IP. Oh, sorry. It, please avoid. Okay, so I won't call it soft IP. I will call it. Um, I'm reading the comments. Um, so instead of calling it soft IP, I'll call it. Uh, trademark copyright and <laughs> okay trademark copyright and um publicity rights privacy advertising i'll use those terms but it's just a it's a common terminology i would say just in terms of um how we're dividing the sciences where you're in you know chemistry and software and technology and engineering versus the ones where you're in trademark copyright land and with that i'll hand it back over to mason Thank you, thank you, very, very uh, interesting stuff. So as we look at, I guess, the attention that this industry is getting from across the uh, various stakeholders, I thought it would be fascinating to, to hear from uh, someone at the National Football League as they are moving very, very uh, aggressively into this area. So Arthur, please uh, share with us your perspective of how your uh, uh, league is, uh, participating in this as well as helping with the diversity uh, in this industry. Great. Thanks, Mason and Aaron and Eva. I, I, that, that's wonderful because what you what you guys or ladies just covered is uh, essentially the um, the essence of the work that's done before it comes to us as a product for sponsorship and endorsement and licensees. Um, and as, as Gordon knows, in terms of uh, our work with with Madden, that that property in and of itself is very valuable to the National Football League in terms of how we um, engage fans, which is one of our big things. 
One of, one of the things that most people don't understand about the National Football League is that it's really an entertainment company, right? Uh, and it's something that I've learned over time uh, working in the space for many years is that our, our entertainment is football on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday. Uh, and it happens nationally, oftentimes by um, vi video through television rights and those kind of things. But over the years, um, we have moved into what we consider to be one of our revenue streams, uh, and that being uh, the gaming space, right? Which was the, with the advent of the uh, the Madden game that many many people play. In fact, my sister loves Madden and asks me for a Madden game every every new season. Um, there are about 20 million uh, people who play uh, Madden, uh, NFL Madden. Uh, and our our job there is again to try to engage our fan base to keep them in, um, engaged and wanting to watch the real the the event in and of itself on Sunday Monday and and Thursday. Uh, um, and so part of all of this technology is is our ways for us to continue to engage and drive our fans. Um, the fan base in terms of the um, NFL fans and gaming and gamers. Uh, is around 40 million. And then those that are NFL fans and a number of general gamers, just people who play video games in and of themselves, is around 95 million people. And, and as most people don't know, uh, we have total what we call avid fans. There's probably about 187 million fans that are uh, just pure football fans. And so in that space, in terms of as we try to grow to grab eyeballs and content, um, of being a content provider as well the the e space or the gaming space is is, is one of those uh, areas in which we we look to expand um, and then we do that in several different ways right and so that uh, our so our core products are like the Madden games um, and then we have uh, licensee pieces where, where we have uh, I guess in the and I would say this in the in the main space where that that is would be the console gaming space and I know a lot of it has moved online now. And so for, there are games like Fortnite where we have a licensed players uh, name, image and likeness and club logos and uniforms to be avatars as the gamer player. So a gamer would be able to uh, identify Mason Ash as one of their favorite football players, drop Mason's name, uh, uh, his uniform or his team, and that they could play as Mason. In, throughout the game. And so those are ways in which we try to completely engage our, our, our younger fan base. And what we know is that fan base is uh, the gaming fan base, uh, the esport fan base is actually mirrors much of what our fan base would be. You know, we're we're all looking for those 18 to 50 year old people who uh, happen to um, uh, that are, are, are like the marketer's dream, is, so to speak. And then the other thing we look at in terms of this space is what the, de the demographics also mirror our fan base, right? And that is, is that um, about 60% of the fan base or the participants in the esports are white, about 10 or 17, so between, somewhere between, I'm sorry, somewhere between 10 and 15% of, of the uh, participating uh, fan base is black. And then the other, other space, uh, the other numbers fall into the Hispanic and Asian and others. Uh, groups and so that sort of really mirrors the people that we are uh, trying to attract uh, as fans um, uh, to to our game and and how we then incorporate um, what they're doing into what we're doing and and some of the things that have come up like influencers, ambassadors, and all those um, people who who drive uh, interest and in content uh, become important to, to us as a, a strategic uh, business planning. Uh, one of the things that we we have been doing over the last few years is working with uh, a partnering with uh, HBCU um, in terms of uh, creating diversity and inclusion and the introduction of uh, sports uh, and the foot, National Football League as a, a viable place for work um, and, and inclusion. Um, when I say inclusion, meaning that there are opportunities that are broad based that are not just on the field. And so we have, we have uh, a number of uh, um, initiatives that assist uh, and introduce the National Football League to um, HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges. I always hate saying that because it just always feels so funny being a, a graduate of Morehouse and Howard. Uh, it's just where I went to school. And so um, 
uh, but given that it's been labeled that, we, we use those terms. Um, but part, part of what we do is we've partnered with um, the, the CIAA, uh, the MEAC, the SWAC, um, and uh, the uh, SIAC, uh, and, and help sponsor uh, those conferences put, put on uh, um, uh, tournaments, right? And so, uh, and then there are those that are not part of that, that you, those uh, conferences like Florida Memorial International, where they started a, a esports program uh, and where we have been supportive uh, in, in, in planning and supporting those or supporting the university and planning, uh, the conferences uh, and planning, uh, having tournaments. And it's all part of also driving um, uh, participation, interest in sports, as well as uh, the technologies piece that that Aaron and Eva mentioned uh, as viable workspaces and also uh, ownership rights, as as we call them. So um, I'll stop there. Um, and 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 I know we want to have some time to to hear from from Gordon. Uh, and so Mason, if that, and I'll be available as we would say for. For questions, I, I'd certainly like to get questions from from our audience there. So I hope that was a quick, uh, they call it what we call high level overview of some of the things that we're doing. That was excellent. And I checked the uh, the chat room there. There's a question or two there that uh, for you we'll come back to. So Gordon, help us understand wh where we are and where is this thing going. So you know, there's that phrase you want to go to where the puck is going, right? So we're, we're, how do we position ourselves and our clients and community? to go where this thing is going. Help us understand that as a as a forecast and you're muted. You're muted. You're I'm muted. trying, I, I know, I know, just trying okay. to be polite. There's so much <laughs> intelligence going on here. So sometimes you've got to just listen. So I just need to listen. Um, before I go in too deep, I've got to acknowledge, so Arthur, I know your name from way back in the day, a lifetime ago, Clay Walker days. Yes, yeah, Clay, yes. Uh, yeah, Clay, like 25 Clay was, years ago, so just everyone knows. Ah, here's a lesson for everyone in the crowd. You are going to see the same faces you're seeing in the chat for the rest of your lives. So be kind Absolutely. to each other. Add each other on LinkedIn, right? Add all these attorneys on LinkedIn today so that you can know them going forward so that we can, you know, build wealth, not just the riches of this hour. That'd be That's my right. number, number one thing. Um, and thank you for bringing us all together, Mason. As far as where the puck is going, I'm going to go back to ownership. I'm going to raise an example. I'm not an attorney. My brother's an attorney. My dad's an attorney. I'm not an attorney. So I'm going to make an observation, not a legal statement. Okay? Everyone remember the NBA bubble, right? Where a bunch of black folks and people of all races were in a bubble, okay, which they weren't allowed to leave, okay, until their labor was done, okay? for which they got compensated a little bit here and there, what was left of the money. However, um, when they decided to protest murder, okay, of our people, what happened was they wanted to keep them in the bubble. And so what they did was they had some very important conference calls. You might go, why conference calls? Because the people who own the content weren't in the bubble, okay? They were distributing the content around the world, okay? They were collecting all the fees and living their life free. And so the opportunity that we have, even in partnerships like what we're building right now with the NFL and HBCUs, is the opportunity to raise young people who not only can play Madden, okay, with proficiency, but can learn how to collect revenue from Amazon and Twitch and be a partner, right? Can learn how to build their own channels and all the things that it means to own your content versus being someone else's talent, right? And they're gonna need you, attorneys, to help them do that, okay? Because if you don't know today, you will find out in your life you are what you own, okay? Like I summarized my whole career, blah, 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 a bunch of people I worked for, no. I owned a piece of a company called Z-Axis, that we sold to Activision, okay? Paid for my house, paid for my car, not Madden. Love you, Madden. Love you, NFLPA, but you didn't pay for it, right? And there's an opportunity that um, you as attorneys have 
to put people in place to be a bigger part of the value chain of the content, right? And this content isn't that different than Disney content, right? Or whatever conventional type of content experiences you're thinking about. It's generated through interactivity, but ultimately so much of the value, right? is in the played, shared, viewed experience. You were talking about the fan base author of NFL, right? It's a great example. Um, many more people watch the NFL than play football, okay? Many, many more watch the NFL than play pro football for sure, okay? Games are transforming the same way, where it might not be obvious to an old person because we grew up playing and there was no way to view. But for your generation that's coming up now, many, many more people around the world are viewing this interactive content that are actually joystick or controller in hand doing something proficient with it. And so the question becomes, where are we in that value chain of viewed content? You happen to have other from the NFL, great expert. You should be copy po copy pasta, learning from, replicating, right? The things that he could share with you, right? That Aaron could share with you, that Evan could share with you about owning that content. Period, right? Period, period, period. We talk about a lot of things. Let's get to questions because this is like a service to the audience. I don't want to be, you know, about me, and I want to hear more from from Aaron and Ava. I want to hear more myself. <laughs> Well, fantastic. So, Arthur, do you have yeah. a response to uh, the gentleman that uh, wrote here? Does the NFL have exclusive or primary rights in the players' personas? And do the players get a cut of the publicity rights in their images when they're used on Fortnite and elsewhere? The answer to that question is yes, they do, right? So, uh, as Gordon said, that uh, he mentioned the NFL. Look at that. Hi, Tom. Um, <laughs> there's uh, uh, what they call a, a th through two things. One, the group licensing component. Uh, the players uh, receive a, a payment for their participation and using their name, image, and likeness in all the video games. And so to take something away from EA, they say it's in, they, they used to say, I don't know if they still say it, it's in the game, right? And that being that the that their game looked just like it did on the field. And they simulated the moves of the players. They had their their faces. Um, and then uh, and some of their um, patented um, skill set moves, as we would say. And so those individuals uh, are paid for that, uh, for their participation in the video game, um, as well as any of the advertisement that goes along with it. So they get a portion of the sales that goes to the Players Association that is distributed to the to the players so yes yeah I but I, I would say still the best thing is as as gordon said in this space where you all are protecting the players is one thing but this is an opportunity to see about what to see what you can own and and i and i would i would second that that position that that you move towards uh developing your skill set and quickly get into the ownership space as, as soon as possible yeah, I was going to just add that like college kids are navigating this, right? Like specifically in an economy where not that I've diminished the value of a college education, right? But part of the contract, it's so clear to me. So I teach at USC, right? And let me tell you something. The math team is not on the road flying around anywhere. Chemistry team's not flying anywhere. Law school team, law review isn't flying anywhere. But God, sure, if I do not get every week waivers from the basketball team, that's got to fly to Seattle, Portland, here, there, everywhere, okay, with a hard constraint on their ability to extract value from the time spent, right? It's like a hard, the hardest salary cap ever since the before times, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, where no matter how much value you create, right, no matter, it doesn't matter. They can score a thousand points, they can have a hundred TV rating. They can sell a million jerseys. They've got a real hard cap on the value that they're able to extract. And that's colliding with the internet generation where if I stream, okay, on content, right? If I, if I dribble a basketball on YouTube or on Twitch, well, the cap is now determined by a different deal, okay? Which is tied to the value of the content I create. 
And so this is like a new tension, right? That is uh, that is that lawyers are going to solve, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. create once again, I'll say it again, ownership patterns where oh, I created this much value. But, NFL players, same thing, right? I remember back in the day, like the NFL players deal and the NFL deal. Big tension. Who's the value, right? It used to be a big deal with the NFL to keep the helmets on the players, right? Keep the helmets on. Don't take your helmet off and celebrate because someone might recognize you and you might be of value that we got to then pay, <laughs> right? So anyway, it's just an exciting topic. So there's a question here that's interesting. Um, can you explain what the NFTs or the non-fungible tokens are and also what trends do you see in this space and how can our people get in on it for the panel? Gordon, you have any uh, perspective on that? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, what is a non-fungible token? Well, okay, this is a legal question. But so what it, I'll give you a metaphor um, that'll help you explain. So like a Bitcoin, without making too complicated, is a Bitcoin, is a Bitcoin, is a Bitcoin, like a quarter, right, that we could trade. And if I have a Missouri quarter and you have an Alabama quarter, there's still a quarter, right? A non-fungible token is a unique digital item. It's like a rare baseball card, okay? And imagine that they're creating these rare baseball, digital baseball cards that you can then own, and I've got the only one like it. OK, and there has been created this market around, oh, I've got this unique one. And I'm going to try to inflate the value of this unique one like I have the only Tom Brady rookie card. I've got the only one of these. OK, and that's what a non fungible token at a very high level is. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but at a, just a, you know basic understanding it's not like a currency it's a non-fungible token it can't be traded directly for something else because it's unique in its nature excellent excellent so gordon as another follow-up question for you here can you elaborate just a bit more on creating value and equity it appears that platforms are not owned by the content creators for example should professional athletes be demanding royalties and tv production apparel sales views and outside professional sports, can content creators leverage their following to the platform owners? This is uh, from uh, uh, one of our guests. Here. Sure. I mean, I think throughout the history of person kind, people have leveraged their content creation against platform owners. Is that not what television, film, like all media do that? I think that uh, sometimes we don't know our own strength, right, to uniquely speak to audience. Like speaking once again to the HBCU esports example. OK, um, right now you can diminish the value by looking at metrics, but you could inflate the value by looking at cultural relevance and innovation in the content. Right. And then use that to examine who the best distribution partner is for your unique proposition. Like once again, I think uh, all too often. We, and I mean we collectively black people, will do something innovative, something we think is like breathing, but is actually quite innovative, okay, and quite valuable, but then sort of give it away for free or relatively free to get famous, right, to get fame for the, for, for someone else to distribute it, like to be recognized. And I won't go to the historic origins, but I will just say that if we just sort of start from a point like, okay, it doesn't matter whether I'm famous or not famous, I just want my value, <laughs> right? I just want what's, what's fair. That would change a lot of discourse, right? Um, and yeah, I, I, we go really deep, but that is a fundamental thing, like the the establishment of value, like you've asked, versus fame, which is someone else distributing and extracting value and giving you a cut, which are two fundamentally different things that we need to culturally change, right, systemically change. And the only way to do that is by having owners, right? Because you have enough owners. It's like lawyers. Ah, black lawyers, right? Well, look, four black lawyers. Look, whole room of black lawyers. <laughs> Lawyers are black, right? Same thing with owners, right? By creating a whole ecosystem of people who own content, who don't just perform and then get, you know, in the bubble, right? And then get distributed by others. 
that's going to change everything, like forever. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, it looks like you have a question here in the chat. Uh, could you uh, respond to that? Um, you want me to read it to you or can you see it? Uh, basically, it says here, apart from uh, the Alice Mayo uh, step two patentable subject matter debate, the person here is uh, uh, is uh, Timothy Koba is uh, wondering if obtaining patent protection on software may run into other Section 101 considerations, such as hindering the promotion of progress, especially if the protected code is a broad process slash idea. Similarly, as machine learning continues to grow in popularity, perhaps AI-generated source code may run into problems with the invention chip requirement. I'm so glad he's asking you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'll, I'll oh wait, am I on? Okay, I'm not on mute. Um, so I'll start with the first one. You know, I don't think this is uh, specific to uh, software patents. There's always a concern um, that whatever um, is being claimed is going to preempt um, too much, and 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 doing so, um, and doing so hindering the progress of 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 the field. So I think what the comment or the question is directed to is kind of at the heart of um, the patent law itself. So if if something's not already invented and the claims generally are for, for, for drafting purposes, you want to draft them as broadly as possible. So um, to, to, to protect as much as you can without um, uh, stepping on someone else's toes. And what in, in new areas, um, in particular, like video game software and things like that, that are that aren't uh, there aren't much other um, uh, publications out there about. You can get quite a bit in your in your protection scope, and so what that does is it prevents other people um, from being able to um, use or invent things in that scope that you have now um, you have now claimed. And so with 101, there's obviously the, the core of it is preemption. Um, you, you can see that in the case law. And preemption just is, is preempting others from um, using the, 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 your invention. And so it's, it's, it's a consideration. The courts are considering it. It's, it's kind of like the baseline. So yes, I think um, 101 has a, a direct relationship to um, preemption concerns. Um, but at the same time, patenting and patent protection is important to our um, foundation. It's one of the first articles. Um, and so without patenting, what, um, what sort of um, incentive do people have to invent if they cannot be compensated for their invention? So it's actually you know, still progressing um, rather than hindering um, the, the fields of invention. So that, that would be my answer to the first question. Uh, and the second question, um, was it machine learning continues to grow in popularity, perhaps AI generated source code may run into problems with inventorship requirement. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by the inventorship requirement. Um, machine learning and AI is growing and um, the, the the source code, like I mentioned, is not really in the bucket of patents. It's more in um, the copyright bucket. But if you know you're describing a method um, and AI is involved in that, um, that potentially can be patentable. So again, I'm not sure what they mean by inventorship requirements. So I'm not sure I can truly answer that question. All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's now for the few minutes we have left, I'm going to go around the horn here. Eva, uh, tell us about what you would like to see in the space that you are uh, practicing as it relates to esports. Is there anything you like to trend, you don't like to trend, but just kind of give us a closing remarks on 
where you see things. And I'm going to come around the horn to everyone. Arthur, there's a question for you as well on um, basically the NFL's patent IP um, and the uh, NFL supplier diversity initiative. So you can think about that before we get to you. And so, but Eva, please um, share with us uh, your thoughts uh, as we close out. So I think my statements um, back a lot on what Gordon said. It's, do you want to be wealthy or do you want to be famous? Um, so a lot of the copyright publicity rights issues that we're we're facing, and you just to pause, you can be both, but let's let's also think of priorities. So a lot of the copyright publicity right issues we're facing are dealing with sharing your culture, sharing your ideas, sharing the your creativity and your innovation, and then sharing it to the world without having any protections about over it or considering what protections you can place on it before you share it with the world. So that's kind of what I would push out there to think through these issues up front and to get a game plan for your brand. Thank you. Thank you. Arthur? Um, so I, I, I would say that the you, you always want to be ahead of the curve, right? But you have to know what's, you have to understand the trends. And so where, where we are um, and what we're confronted with is uh, uh, what's happening at the collegiate level as it relates to name, image, and likeness. And what those rules are uh, and how they would be applied to the collegiate athlete. And then those athletes moving into our space as we, as we control the content uh, and sponsorship and uh, utilization of player name, image, and likeness going forward. So we're, we're watching that at the moment. Uh, we happen to be on the, uh, the, the Uniform Commercial Law uh, Committee that's working on drafting legislation for the name, image, and likeness. Uh, and then I say that I would say that uh, there are new emerging companies who are trying to control the, that space, and they are they have gone around the country visiting with universities making sure that are, are establishing themselves as the specialists to own or to manage large groups of players um, and their likenesses to assist them in their social media and other platforms uh, going forward. So that's a that's a big deal. And that's something that's so in my mind, that's an emerging market for lawyers. Right. And so that's, you know, and, and, and so Mason starts a company that manages all those athletes uh, rights for more than just gaming, but also for social media and endorsing endorsers or influencers or that kind of thing. Um, so I would say that's that's what we're that's what we're looking at um, uh, from 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 a league standpoint at the moment. Uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, Aaron, I'm gonna let you uh, give us some parting words before we'll let uh, Gordon take us out uh, with his uh, final remarks as well. Okay, so. Um, you know, as a as a Spelman alum and as a, and I'm talking to students at HBCUs, I do want to take this opportunity to um, encourage more um, involvement in STEM programs and in um, pat the patent field. So I didn't even learn about patents until I was in graduate school, so I was well into my 20s, and I think that is somewhat common. Um, especially if you don't in our communities where you don't have family members that are lawyers or you don't have family members or friends that are um, engineers. And so I think it's really important to come to panels like this. You can hear about new um, careers and if and no, my resume seems like it was a path of planned events, but it's actually not. It was actually just a a path of not knowing what I wanted to do or where I was going. And, um, you know, God just sort of led me to this career, um, but I had no idea about it. So it's it's a very lucrative career. Um, I, I help um, others um, uh, protecting the rights. I, I'm getting um, good exposure um, to companies like Microsoft and um, other big name companies. And so I would just encourage you to uh, look past the careers that you see on television. There are other careers that um, that um, are very, uh, like I mentioned, lucrative and very fulfilling. So I just want to um, leave you with that. Uh, Gordon? Cool. Um, well, first, I was going to put my link in the chat because y'all have already self-selected for excellence. So I know there's excellence out there because you're making the time for yourself. I, I, I know. So um, it's so interesting. 
um, the difference between being valuable and being of value. Okay, so historically, once again, not an attorney, but the things which were protected were things which are born of abundance. Like, right, like if I paint a big painting or I write a big book or whatever, then that was determined to be of value. However, historically, um, black people have built out of scarcity, right, and have built incredible things from their from ourselves, right? The things we're talking about, dances being a value, right? Your voice, your saying, your, your expression being a value uh, is from the strength forged like in scarcity. And part of the legal work is to take that from being just valuable to others to being of value, okay? Where everyone is going into the room being of value. The a borderline to think about is this. Um, I think you've seen where tattoo artists have started to be protected, right? They put the tattoos in the game. They're like, nope, that's my artwork. Nope, pay me, right? On the other side of that are these people creating these dances, creating these phrases literally from their souls, from their hearts, right? And people are saying, oh, you can't own that yet, okay? Right? You can't let us, you know, legislate. As soon as we move the bar forward to people being of value innately and thus of course their expressions are worth owning that changes the whole game because that democratizes ownership that means right that young i'll talk about black people grow up knowing that they own something right right they can negotiate the value but they know right that their expression their uniqueness their power right is of value going into the negotiation, okay? And now they're working on the price. No one can tell them it's not worth it, it's not patentable, it's not, you know, sorry, talk to my lawyers, because they would know, right? And they need you to move that discourse forward, okay? Because the best stuff hasn't even been invented yet. Given these digital tools that exist, there's going to be some things that come into our community that you're going to be like, it's going to be like the moonwalk. You're like, what? I didn't even know you could bring these things together that way, right? And so that foundation, though, that like, oh, the benefit of that isn't how can I just get famous, to go back to what we're saying, how can I own, distribute, and scale is the, is what your lifetime, your 2020s to 2070s, that's where you're going to be on the front lines of and the pushback against that. That's my thought. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I think we're out of time, and this was absolutely insightful, and we all appreciate your um, involvement. Charlie, I hand you the mic. Man, y'all just did a Kobe crossover spin move when somebody tried to reach, dropped them on their ankle, and just slam dunked this. You guys were phenomenal. I am getting text messages and messages from everywhere. Just saying how brilliant you all are. Well, well done. Uh, everyone join me in giving them a round of applause. Mason, I trust your judgment. You tell me whoever you want to bring, you got it. This is why, people. This is why. Last minute, it don't matter. This this panel was all love. We got a, a, a lot out of this. And uh, thank you. We are preparing you all have a break. And then we are going to go into the CLE portion at 11.05. We will be back here and we will have our year in review, patent, trademark, and copyright. So the wizard that you saw, that was not a hack. That was actually a partner who is going to present in that costume. So I just want you to know we are still safe and secure. Our data. And I was wondering. I just like a player. Right. Go call yes. 911. I, I was worried. I have a new team of lawyers. I was right. ready. I was ready. I was like, let me get, let me get these TMs. Yeah. Did, did you notice how cool everybody was? We yeah. just like kept going. It was like, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm praising this panel. Other panels might have freaked out, stopped, and trust you, Charlie. You guys trust you. never missed a beat. We trust you, Charlie. I thought we we thought you wouldn't let us get uh, invaded. I, All right. I don't know. All right.
Thank, well, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank and you everyone putting this together. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, thank you. Even, yeah, everybody yeah, stay in touch with each other. I'll say it again. Stay in touch. Absolutely. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna know if you don't know today. You're gonna yes. know in the future. <laughs> That's right. Accept yeah. my request on LinkedIn. Okay. And I know y'all will. I'm already <laughs> with the half of you all. But thank you again. And just for again. For your own personal reference, I am getting buzzed left and right. You all did a great job. Thank Good. you. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, everybody, be safe. Gordon, yes. what, what, you know, we, we do a program over at the uh, communication school for the players as, uh, as part of uh, learning to do uh, public speaking. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be over that way um, sometime this month if, if everything opens up for us to have the class. Coming, you're coming, 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 you're coming out west? Yeah, so we do we do the uh, speakers bureau at U uh, at the at the Annenberg School. Oh yeah, yeah, Annenberg no. School? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right over oh. there. Yeah. Well, let me tell you just one thing real quick. Oh, because we reached in our room, right? We're not we're not on stage. Okay, so you, right, we're just us talking. You, you are on. Okay, I just want to let. Okay, you know, so don't share no private information, but you are welcome to talk. It's the break. People are here to listen. Oh.